All right. <laughs> so I guess I'm making the case against maintenance rituximab in follicular lymphoma. And before uh, we, the session started, Gilles and I were talking and saying that we could probably speak from the same slide set because a lot of the data is the same. But I think there's some interpretation that could be a little bit different. So you'll see some of this uh, before. I think when we talk about treatment, particularly in this disease, we have to take a step back. And I'm going to echo a little bit to what uh, Tom Witzig said. What are the goals of treatment when you're treating a disease that, at least at this point, we don't think we're necessarily curing? Uh, so, so the key goal would be to change the natural history of the disease. So in follicular lymphoma, we could say if we could decrease transformation, which has morbidity and mortality associated with it, that would be a goal. Or ultimately improve survival, clearly a goal. But if we can't do that, then we always talk about, well, we've got to put the patient in remission. So why would we want to do that? Well, it would be to make patients feel better but the issue in follicular lymphoma is that just the presence of disease is often asymptomatic. And whether or not a patient uh, is, is having symptoms is not at all referable to having a few centimeters of lymphadenopathy in various nodal groups. So the other reason to treat would be to just improve quality of life. So historically, people said, well, a good thing about you know, giving maintenance might be that it avoids chemotherapy. And, and Gilles actually made that point, or implied that, I think, in his PRIMA analysis, saying that 80% of patients go on and get chemotherapy. We're now in an era in the United States where there are many non-chemotherapy options. So frequently, at relapse of follicular lymphoma, drugs like idelalisib and lenalidomide are early choices for those patients. So I think we have to think about value. This is the, the big buzzword in oncology now. So it has to do with what the benefits are and what the risks or, or costs are to both a patient as well as to society. And I think it's, it's important when we think about follicular lymphoma why progression-free survival was ever thought to be important. So in the 1990s, this was a trial of observation versus chlorambucil. There was no difference in overall survival, but take a look at these curves. I mean, the median overall survival of low tumor burden patients in that era was 6.7 years, with a median overall survival of only 34% at 10 years. So um, obviously, things have markedly changed. And if you look at the Stanford cohort, for patients who had no initial therapy, the median overall survival is now 15.1 years. And in this most modern era, the median overall survival is probably exceeding 18 years for patients who present with advanced stage follicular lymphoma. So what does it mean if we change progression-free survival by several months or even a couple of years when you're talking about a disease that's going to have a 20 or more year nat natural history. And I use the analogy when I talk to patients, this managing this disease is like running a marathon. And you know, how important is it to, to make the, the first three or four miles look great when you have all these years ahead of you? And you really have to think about the fact that if there isn't evidence that you're changing the natural history of the disease, it may not be so important to use PFS as an endpoint. So Gilles showed this trial where progression-free survival was demonstrated with giving rituximab maintenance when you compare to watch and wait. Treatment, you know, people stay in remission longer than no treatment. That's probably not a surprise. But at least with the follow-up thus far, there's no change in overall survival. And look at what the overall survival is. It's going to take a long time to, to see any difference in, in overall survival. It suggests to me that in this experimental group where patients got two years of, of rituximab, a lot of patients were over-treated. And it sounded like Gilles agreed with, with that uh, effect. Similarly, in the resort trial, um, Gilles showed you this slide with the design of the resort trial. No difference in time to treatment failure, whether you give uh, continuous rituximab maintenance or scheduled retreatment of rituximab. Tiny difference between 
um, time to first cytotoxic therapy, which is a soft endpoint because it's the physician who decides whether it's cytotoxic therapy or not. Um, what was not emphasized in the previous discussion is that maintenance rituximab costs money. So although maintenance rituximab was superior for time to cytotoxic therapy, there was three and a half times more rituximab used when patients were put on the scheduled uh, maintenance. And this all happened before the approval of idelalisib. Now, this was not shown by Gilles, but I think a very important paper that came out uh, earlier this year that looked at quality of life comparing between maintenance and retreatment rituximab. Because another reason why people say that maintenance is important is that patients like to be in remission. Patients feel better in remission. My patient you know, doesn't want to relapse. There's a lot of anxiety associated with that. So, you know, I will be the first to say that our tools to measure quality of life are blunt, and uh, we really need to do better at this. But given the tools that we have, this trial on resort uh, included quality of life measures. And interestingly, illness-related anxiety was comparable between treatment arms at all time points, even though the patients who were on the retreatment rituximab, by definition, were having relapse events during the, the trial. And similarly with uh, FACT and, and other measures, there were really no differences. If anything, there was a slight increase in anxiety just during the maintenance uh, treatment, probably because of coming into the, the treatment center. So the point is, is that when it's been studied and when patients understand what the, what the protocol is, we actually don't have data that suggests that patients prefer to be in remission. It sounds like that would be the case, but remember, they, they feel fine. Um, there's no physical symptoms associated with the presence of disease. So if we take the low tumor burden patients, it sounds like we have a pretty good consensus. There's no survival benefit, no evidence that we're changing the natural history of the disease. It doesn't impact the duration of rituximab sensitivity. It doesn't make patients feel better, and it increases costs and probably toxicities to a small amount. So how about uh, the uh, high tumor burden situation? I'll show the slides that Dr. Saul shared with me a couple of years ago. He's probably regretting that he shared them with me at this point, but he reviewed the PRIMA trial. Again, this was in high tumor burden patients, rituximab maintenance versus observation. After our chemotherapy, most patients got our CHOP. So the original publication looked like this, uh, a progression-free survival benefit for uh, the group who got rituximab maintenance. And at six years, as, as Gilles showed, uh, that persisted. Uh, however, the overall survival at six years looked exactly the same. And look at how good this overall survival is. So whether or not you got maintenance, almost 90% of patients are still alive at six years. And uh, it, you know, we've seen similar data from the, the SWOG S0016. Now, uh, looking at this, uh, if you look at transformation, which would, be, again, be the other reason to maybe give maintenance, you, you try to decrease transformation risk, there's absolutely no difference in transformation between uh, the group who got rituximab maintenance and the group that got observation. So if you think about this, um, although progression-free survival benefits seem to uh, persist, there was no overall survival benefit. Similar numbers of patients died from lymphoma in both arms. No differences in histological transformation. And more than half of the patients in the control group who didn't get any maintenance still didn't need any treatment at 70 months of follow-up. So for more than half of the patients, you'd be over-treating them, even if your goal was to just increase remission duration. So the reason uh, that I would say that there are some similarities between Resort and Prima is what would have happened if Prima was written like Resort and retreatment rituximab was the option. Could retreatment rituximab be an option in advanced stage disease rather than rituximab maintenance? And I would suspect that if the resort design 
were employed in the PREMA trial, there would be no difference between a maintenance, maintenance rituximab and retreatment rituximab strategy. Because I think the impact of the maintenance on progression-free survival is much more on later events than the early events that Tom Witzig was referring to. So I think that it's not that different. The other thing that was mentioned is that RCHOP is no longer um, the only standard follicular lymphoma induction treatment. It's certainly a reasonable treatment, but data would suggest, and many uh, people in the United States are using BR, and there isn't any maintenance data with BR. The baseline of BR looks like it may be slightly better, so the maintenance would have to work even harder to ultimately show any overall survival or transformation benefit. Now, um, the question is, you know, are there subsets of patients who may benefit from maintenance? And uh, the answer is I, I can't say that there are or aren't. When it was looked at, it's not clear to me that we have any hints. So this was uh, looking at PET scanning um, in patients who were either PET negative on the top or PET positive on the bottom. In the PRIMA study, in the group who was either observed or got rituximab maintenance, these were a subset of patients. This wasn't the whole trial, but it just suggests that in both groups, there weren't that many differences. It's not as if all the benefit from maintenance on progression-free survival could be identified if you were either PET positive or PET negative. So if I were to summarize, I think there really isn't a routine role for maintenance rituximab in follicular lymphoma. Uh, there is no survival benefit where most patients are doing extremely well. It doesn't impact transformation. It doesn't impact the early recurrence that um, we're, we're so concerned about. In low tumor burden disease, rituximab retreatment has been proven to be equivalent in a randomized trial. There's no clear quality of life benefit. It costs more. There's more toxicity. There's no data of maintenance uh, following bendamustine rituximab, which is the treatment that we generally use. And I believe that new treatment options like idelalisib, lenalidomide, abrutinib will further change the treatment paradigm and, if anything, threaten the role of rituximab maintenance more because if you're trying to avoid chemotherapy by prolonging PFS, we have other tools to do that. So thank you. And I better um, get to the uh, clicker quickly so I can vote now <laughs> so I at least get one vote. <laughs>